Hello, everybody, to this nice, uh, beautiful winter day, March, uh, sunny day in the Zubi Lecture Series. My name is Frank Sligas, Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture. I'm um, directing the Zubi Lecture Series. And um, so I just want to make some announcement before uh, we come to the real topic here. Uh, next week, we have a uh, Zubi Lecture with Bryce Merriman. And, uh, his talk is about making space, optimistic city making strategies for addressing urban homelessness. So uh, please join us next week too. And um, I thank everybody who's behind the scenes here. This is uh, Stacey, this is Nathan. And um, I will hand it over to Carolina to, to introduce our guest. Thank you, Frank. Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to uh, introduce today's guest, uh, Sarah Jensen Carr. She's an architect, a landscape architect, and an academic uh, whose work focuses on the intersection of public health and urban landscapes. She's a faculty member at Northeastern University, and I would say a rising rock star in academia. Uh, she's assistant professor of architecture and the program director for the Master of Design in Sustainable Environments. She is the author of, I would say, one of the hottest books to come out soon, or if maybe, did, is it come out already? No, uh, uh, July, I just July. heard. July. And accident, right. accidentally hottest. <laughs> <laughs> so the, her book, The Topography of Wellness, How Health and Disease Shaped the Ur American Urban Landscape, um, explores how epidemics have shaped um, urban landscapes and their implication for current and future practice. This topic could not be more timely as we grapple with our current COVID pandemic, but also as we become increasingly aware of how our physical, mental, and emotional wellness is deeply interconnected to our shared physical environment. So without further ado, I would like to give Sarah a warm UMass welcome. Welcome, Sarah. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Frank and Carolina for that. A uh, warm welcome. I, I wish I was uh, with you all in person today, but um, but I do thank you for having me, and I hope to hope to make it to the other side of the state sometime soon. So, <laughs> um, uh, so uh, Carolina mentioned the book, and that'll be most of what I'm talking about today. But um, um, I wanted to start, uh, you know, especially for those of you that are studying landscape architecture. <clears throat> to give you a little bit um, about my background. Um, before I start, um, I just wanted to recognize that I'm currently speaking you, to you from my home, uh, which is just south of Boston. Um, and as very appropriate for a talk about landscape and health, I want to thank and acknowledge that I sit on the occupied territory of the Wampanoag and Massachusetts tribe and uh, just express my gratitude for their stewardship of the land, which fosters all of our health, uh, despite the generations of injustice that have been inflicted upon them. So um, as Carolina mentioned, I'm, I'm an architect, I'm a landscape architect, now I, now I teach. Um, and my journey to thinking about this topic did start in my architecture work. And so after, architecture school, um, I, I kind of fell in to healthcare architecture at a firm in New Orleans, which is where I was at the time, um, somewhat accidentally, but I, I really, I, I, you know, I really found an interest in it. I think what I liked about it was, um, first of all, the integration of research, what we would call evidence-based design um, into the design of environments, um, thinking about how design can heal people in, in acute situations. Um, and so I, I worked on healthcare projects um, in patient psychiatric units, rehabilitation units, maternity wards, operating rooms across the entire uh, spectrum, which really introduced me to um, a great deal of research. Uh, most of it done in New Orleans and Gulfport. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how I sort of shifted tracks. Um, and so I, when I, after I shifted tracks, my first academic appointment was actually at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And I had a joint appointment there in the School of Public Health and the School of Architecture. Um, that was about seven years ago. And I feel like people would always ask me, 
well, why is an architect teaching in the School of Public Health, right? And what's the, the origin of the appointment? But, um, but I really loved it. And you know, I think we talk about, when we talk about interdisciplinary work, sometimes we're just talking about architects and landscape architects uh, working together. But um, you know, working in a public health department, it, it really gave me the opportunity to work in a truly interdisciplinary setting that was completely outside of um, design. And so since I graduated with my PhD, I've done some projects, you know, outside of academia, one working on um, design guidelines for Sacramento County uh, through a community based organization that I'm still associated um, with, which is actually a team made up of a, a, a neurosurgeon, a transportation engineer and, and also planners. So it's great to get their perspectives and they're all interested in, um, in healthy design. Um, in Hawaii, I worked uh, on a pedestrian study for the Department of Transportation and Department of Health that was looking at pedestrian access. And so this is an example. We, we built an app and we were able to get people on the neighbor islands to talk about their physical environments and, and, uh, and send it back you know, automatically to our office in Oahu and, and start to see a picture of active transportation and design. Uh, and now at uh, Northeastern University, a lot of the projects I'm working on look at the intersection of climate change and health uh, with my colleague Jay Cephas. We're looking at uh, demographics and locations of uh, climate change events from wildfire to flooding. Um, and then working with another interdisciplinary team, uh, which is we're actually, we were going to do a workshop just before the pandemic hit and now we've shifted to actually crafting these like hard copy activity journals, uh, which we're sending out to people soon. Um, and asking um, young adults 18 to 24 um, about the mental and physical burden of climate change um, on their lives. So these are somewhat direct projects and this is the way an architect or landscape architect um, can be involved in health issues. But I would say my other interest is about what do changes in the landscape mean for health and especially its implications for health disparities that may already be dramatic. Uh, so some of the research I've brought here from my time in Hawaii, uh, I'm working on a long form piece now that talks about the fracture of the Ahupua uh, in Oahu, which is a social ecological division that the native uh, Hawaiians use to ensure collective abundance and resilience. And I'm writing a piece about um, its fracture, but also how its traces can be read in the urban fabric of, of Honolulu and hopefully be restored in some part. And so, you know, really the question I would say driving my research is this, and how does the design of buildings, landscapes, and the public realm heal or harm us? And that question was really based in a very um, specific personal experience. And so, as I, I mentioned, I was working on healthcare facilities in New Orleans, um, and I, I was working there when Hurricane Katrina hit. And so, like uh, those that had the privilege to, I was able to evacuate. Uh, had the larger privilege of being able to return and you know, living in the older part of the city. Thankfully, my house was not flooded, um, but my life suddenly you know, pivoted in my career just being consumed with the recovery uh, for some time. I mean, not just through my day job where we were doing, you know, instead of designing, we were doing FEMA surveys, we were re rehabilitating client buildings, um, and then my off time going to community planning meetings. And so it got me to thinking that in the absence of hospitals, and for some time there were no operating hospitals um, in New Orleans because we were working on getting them back online, um, I started to think about the effects of the landscape and the, the landscape as healthcare infrastructure in of itself. And I, that's what led me to get my MLA. Uh, so I went out to Berkeley. Um, and I think I naively thought I would come up with some sort of landscape guidelines for health, sort of similar to what you would read when you're designing a hospital, which is the, the AIA, AAH guidelines. But even then, you know, I knew, and I think I put that in my application essay for the people that are thinking about uh, a master's degree later down the road. But I, I think even at that time, I actually knew it was more complicated than that. Um, I, because I had already seen how landscape could be wielded to displace people in the name of well-being and safety. Um, in particular, the type of unspecified sort of top-down green space that we often see in vision plans and we just see green and we think green is good. Um, but for those of you that are not familiar with this, this is the infamous um, green dot map uh, that was released by the Bring New Orleans Back um, Commission 
uh, you know, not too long after Hurricane Katrina hit. And what it did was it just took the low lying areas, right? With no recognizance of the actual like on the ground built environment and said, well, these will be converted to green space. Not saying like what the green space was. You can see the scale of the dots is sort of, you know, really out of whack with the street grid, which the entire street grid isn't even on here. You just see major freeways. Um, and so I think obviously it was discomforting for anybody that lived there. Um, and when you, to be in New Orleans at the time and hear this constant conversation about rebuilding healthier communities and thinking about what was implied with that, especially after most of the African-American population had been driven out of the city and was not able to come back, um, I wanted to look for more specific answers about what that meant. Um, and so I, I will just say, well, I did, and I still very much strongly believe in the power of urban landscapes in addressing health. I, I did come in somewhat skeptical about how these conversations were framed. And I would say really that was the origin um, of my book and the, most of the content, which I'm gonna talk about um, today. So, so yes, as Carolina mentioned, I've actually been working on this book for about seven years and have the good luck or bad luck that, um, you know, to publish it this year, I had to rest it. I had just turned in the manuscript uh, to my publisher before the pandemic hit. Uh, and then there was a delay in publishing on their end. Um, and I said, well, can I have it back and write something about COVID? And I'm, I'm not sure how well those are formed. Maybe they will be out of date by July. <laughs> but I, I did want to share some of those thoughts with you at the end of the talk today. And I, I would certainly love to hear, you know, from students, especially you're the next generation of designers, what you're thinking about right now. Um, but really, I wrote this book in an effort to better understand how our present day landscape um, shapes our health and to understand the history of shifting ideas about public health in the public realm. So also to be clear, I, I'm not a historian. I am a designer, uh, although I am an academic one. Um, and really, like I said, my, my experience, I just wanted to think about how places were formed for health. How did we get to the point um, that, that we were at? Um, and so uh, what I'll be talking about to, today or this afternoon is mostly about how the history of American epidemics got us to the landscape we currently inhabit, and maybe some things we need to keep in mind at this particular inflection point. One thing that really interested me is the conception of what an unhealthy landscape is, perhaps. And you know, during the Industrial Revolution, it was very much um, in the city, and it was that way for, uh, for a long time. However, when I you know, started this research, a lot of the discourse around health and the landscape kind of locused unhealthy behaviors to suburban areas for the first time. And although suburban areas have been put, you know, I would say a false binary in contrast to cities for a long time, um, you know, all of a sudden now it was, um, you know, cities were the, were the place to be and the suburbs are unhealthy because they drive all the time. Not an untrue statement, but we need to unpack the nuance in that a little bit. However, there was also this growing interest I saw from other fields that suddenly interested in how the built environment is formed. In 2016, Karen DeSalvo, who was the interim secretary of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services at the time, said that public health had entered a new era where one's zip code is a better indicator of health than your genetic code. And so I wanted to think about those connections from the environment to our bodies. Um, and also, you know, seeing a, a lot of these books that you know, were published maybe just before I went into architecture school, these are mostly from the 70s and early 80s. And, you know, thinking about the city as a sick city, uh, sick cities, urban crises, uh, dead cities even. Um, these were all books published in the 70s and 80s, whereas when I was starting my work, all of a sudden it's the happy city, right? <laughs> Making healthy places, <laughs> the healthy city, building healthy places. Um, so just wondering what happened here? How did, how did that conception change? And could it be because our health concerns were different? Which I, I just, it, which is part of the story, I think. I, I've come up with this hypothesis of sort that in, in response to epidemics, we have designed our environments to control three things over time. Right? And this gets us to the, to the present day. And that is first miasma, then germs, and then behavior. And so starting a little bit with that word miasma, what the word miasma means, maybe some of you know, but um, you know, dating back to Hippocrates, 480 BC, uh, wrote a book called On Airs, Waters, and Places, and he really connected the health of the environment to the health of those who inhabit it. 
His writings would describe the difference between wholesome and unwholesome waters, the latter being marshy and stagnant, and those who drank from the waters as in possession of large and obstructed spleens, hard bellies, um, being emaciated and hot. So this idea that disease traveled through air, mostly, but also through water, um, this is what we would call miasma theory. And if you think about cities at the time, which had very tangibly foul air, right, and, and foul water in the streets, um, and lots and lots of people were getting sick, then of course we're going to associate the condition of the environment um, to those outcomes. And so this is, you know, this is in New York City in 1900, um, quite typical to have slaughterhouses um, inside city limits. There was no coordinated municipal sanitation um, and air pollution was rampant as well. And many housing units at this time also lacked indoor plumbing or sufficient light and fresh air. And so there were massive outbreaks of cholera, typhoid and yellow fever, which required coordinated action between planners, engineers, public health officials and doctors in the fields. And especially, you know, the fields of public health and the fields of engineering were becoming professionalized at the time as well. And so they saw this, this opportunity to come together and had a common cause. Of particular concern though were these crowded tenements. And this cartoon, which was featured in Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper in 1865, it was called The Tenement Houses of New York, How the Poor Live in Crowded Cities, How Pestilence is Generated, How Parents Are Demoralized and Their Children Depraved. This is the great source of destitution and crime. And so social scientists who were just beginning to explore the connections between environment and behavior pointed to physical density as an actual risk favor for what they called moral contagion, um, as well as disease spread. And cholera and what they would call these filth diseases became ever more correlated with just sort of the generalized urban condition um, and especially people that lived in dense housing. And so here we can see cholera as a skeleton telling the landlord of a tenement that he is about to occupy the premises. Um, tenements were routinely described as perpetual fever nests by New York sanitary inspectors in their survey. So really the first and biggest change to our urban environment that came from disease was from the installation of massive sanitary um, infrastructure. So not just um, you know, separated stormwater pipes, which we still have some of in Boston, um, but many installed these um, combined sewage and wastewater and street runoff pipes. Um, and you know, to install them, our streets had to get wider, they had to get smoother. Um, and a lot of these waterways, or, sorry, a lot of these pipes would just run towards the nearest open waterway because there was a saying called the solution to pollution is dilution. So they weren't really worried about um, polluting the, the ocean. So they were just trying to get it out of the city as soon as possible. And that also, um, you know, it also rang true for open waterways, for open creeks in the city. So people were worried about, um, you know, foul air coming up from them. So they were often just paved over. When they were paved over, it was also an excuse to, um, you know, move out or displace immigrant worker camps, which were often by these same areas. And so, you know, there was a, a, an underlying strategy there to get rid of the people that were also uh, perceived to spread the disease. But, uh, you know, the transformation was really uh, quite notable. Um, and, you know, with, this, with the sanitary movement, it was not just about, I guess, the changing the built environment of the streets, but it was also about the programs, right? And sanitarians like George Waring um, you know, had uh, fleets of people called the white wings, fleets of, 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 fleets of men um, that would clean up. They had to wear white uniforms, right? To give the, the feeling of, of hygiene. But this is in two years. Um, and you can see the change. And in fact, in many streets, uh, well, here they have the cobblestones, but I was reading the sanitary surveys from the 1860s and there was even some, uh, some writing in there that streets should not have cobblestones because they were thought to hold foul air in between them. And so somebody was suggesting Belgian pavement, but by, by paving the streets and you could wash them down at the end of the day and it and obviously gave the appearance of hygiene. Um, and a lot of American cities were also looking to Europe to see how they had controlled their own cholera epidemics. Um, Richard Sennett in the book Flesh and Stone uh, talked about how many 18th and 19th century European cities prioritized circulation and movement via their street networks, um, but also based on the in the wake of uh, physician William Harvey's discoveries about how the heart powered blood circulation. So dirt and grime were thought to clog healthy air throughout the city. Palaces and places of commerce acted as hearts that powered movement. 
and one-way streets were employed to maintain fast movement and mimic the directionality of veins and arteries. And I think you can see a direct correlation if you look at some of the, the plates of Daniel Burnham's plan of Chicago here, especially looking at those um, European precedents. But once streets and sanitary infrastructure, sort of those basic services um, transformed American cities, a, a lot were starting to look at parks as a way to breathe fresh air into cities. And you know, of course, the, our father of landscape architecture, Frederick Law Olmsted, the designer of Central Park, maybe some of you know this already, but he was actually executive secretary of the United States Sanitary Commission for some time. So he had a lot of experience doing sanitary surveys and was um, you know, very interested in public health. Um, Central Park and many of his other uh, designs actually leveraged this lasting fear about miasma um, and his expertise in public health um, to advocate for the health benefits of, of green space and not just about breathing this fresh air in the city, um, but, you know, far before we had all this empirical evidence on how green space and parks can actually alleviate mental health, um, Olmsted was talking about it anecdotally. Uh, and so in one of his writings on public parks and the enlargement of towns, Olmsted wrote, air is disinfected by sunlight and foliage. Foliage also acts mechanically to purify the air by screening it. Opportunity and inducement to escape at frequent intervals from the confined and vitiated air of the commercial quarter and to supply the lungs with air screened and purified by trees and recently acted upon by sunlight together with opportunity and inducement to escape from conditions requiring vigilance, wariness, and activity toward other men. So what Olmsted is describing anecdotally here is maybe what we would call ecosystem services today, right? But he actually he knew this and, and he um, observed it and was also arguing for the presence of parks and urban areas because, and this might sound familiar, he saw the elite try to escape the city to go to their country houses, right? To, to take in the, the health benefits of the country. And he also thought, you know, we needed public parks in cities for the working class. Um, and there's, you know, there's paternal aspects of that we can talk about, maybe talk about it in Q and A, but it was about um, making sure that everybody had access to nature, especially those that could not escape the city. Um, but it's also transformed the overall landscape of the United States. And so health and specifically the search for fresh air was in fact a large driver of the move to Western cities like Phoenix and Denver, uh, which grew significantly by specifically trying to recruit asthmatics to move out there um, and taking advantage of the new railroads. So Dr. Charles Dennison's Rocky Mountain um, Health Resorts, which was written in 1880, advertised Colorado as the Switzerland of the Americas, uh, evoking images of clean mountain air um, but also invoking the generally accepted superior moral values of Europeans. And this map that was drawn by Denison, drawn by the doctor, uh, attempts to show the climatic patterns of Colorado, specifically its dry, cool air. And once again, he tried to connect, you know, good health to supposed good morals. And when he was talking about Colorado Springs, he said it is the home also of a cultivated class of people who have been attracted to the state by health conditions. And so it's estimated that up to a quarter of people who settled in Colorado, Arizona, and California in the late 1800s and very early 1900s did so for their health or family members' health. Um, by 1890, Denver had grown by almost a third with almost 30,000 people moving there to treat uh, consumption specifically. Um, and that rate of growth would persist for the next three decades. So in the next era, germs, these commonly accepted ideas of how environment affected health were upended with the development of vaccines. The immediacy of infectious disease had abated uh, somewhat, um, especially uh, with the creation of the polio and TB vaccines, but it didn't stop architects and landscape architects from exploring these ideas. Knowing that the pandemics of the early 1900s, namely the flu and tuberculosis could be addressed by medicine, Density was no longer an immediate concern, but thinking about how architecture could optimize bodies and health in a really medical manner was still a fascination to many. Uh, of course, uh, chief among them, the architect Le Corbusier. And even though these concepts of health and built environment had become largely theoretical at this point, these lingering ideas about miasma combined with uh, developing uh, building technology, a shift in health towards medicine, um, fears about dangers of the street, which were becoming uh, increasingly congested by cars, really drove a lot of his designs. 
Uh, now his radiant city was conceived as a vertical garden city. So Howard's garden city, which is another prototype that was based on health to move people out of the city. Uh, but what he was doing was trying to take um, the, the sanitary infrastructure and the health uh, structure and, and the health infrastructure vertical. Corbusier thought that he would be liberating his building's residents from the filth and grime. And these machines for living were intensely focused on what he believed the right measurements were for an individual and thought that a community was made simply by reproducing those units over and over again. In his writings for the hypothetical radiant city, um, he had many specifications that there should be 14 square meters per occupant uh, per apartment, uh, 12 meters of plate glass window to let in the exact amount of healthy sunlight. Air should always be at 64.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Eight liters of air would go through the room every minute for what he called exact respiration. Uh, and uh, maybe the most funny thing is that people in the building were not supposed to walk more than 100 meters to transport, and that could be elevator or taxi. Uh, he also wrote that you could only access pure, what he called pure air 50 meters above ground level, which begs the question of who had to live below 50 meters, but it's not answered in his book. And even though Corbusier has only one built work in the United States, I think we can see the influence of his writing, and especially his work with the European Consortium Siam, in many of the public housing units that were built in the mid-century. But without the context of the European social safety net, and especially the deliberate lack of maintenance in a lot of these public housing units, the ideas that they push, such as extreme density to keep green space around buildings, um, looking at the corridor as a space of social interaction instead of the street, um, and then most of all, the aesthetic disruption and separation from existing context ended up being very detrimental to resident health instead. And these mixed metaphors of bodies and cities as public health and design and planning progressively split apart were also wielded to really ruinous ends in the mid century. Uh, at this time, cancer was an epidemic that researchers soon realized could not be conquered by vaccines, even though they tried. Uh, there was actually a federally funded study in the early 1960s that attempted to inject hundreds of monkeys with human tumors um, in an attempt to pinpoint the cancer germ, but it was to no avail. And so the, the sort of hopelessness at the time of dealing with cancer and the fear that it invoked um, was often used to describe you know, what was called the urban crisis at the time. And to understand how much people feared the unknowability of cancer at the time, Susan Sontag uh, wrote in Illness as Metaphor um, in 1977, uh, she wrote, now it is cancer's turn to be the disease that doesn't knock before it enters, cancer that fills the role of an illness experienced as a ruthless secret invasion, a role it will keep until one day its etiology becomes as clear and its treatment as effective as those of TB have become. And so the unknowability of cancer is what made it so terrifying, but it also made it an apt way to communicate the direness of the urban condition and spur action. The concurrent epidemic of urban disinvestment, disintegration, racism and abandonment, which was often commonly referred to as blight to separate it from those forces, often leaned on cancer as a metaphor, especially as it similarly appeared to eat cities from the inside out in the form of fire, vice, and crime. Geographer Michael Deere, uh, attempting to compare urban blight to cancer wrote, the process of abandonment as it operates in space suggests an initial broad scattering of abandoned structures characterized internally by the occurrence of many small groups of abandoned houses. It is essentially a contagious sequence and contagion has major implications for our understanding of the dynamics of abandonment and for policy um, consideration. And at first urban blight was treated as a disease much as cholera was uh, you know, mapped from location to location. Um, uh, researchers would go to, or just urban planners would go to different properties and map the blighted properties one by one to try and figure out if there was a spatial pattern um, of blight. Um, in fact, an architectural forum at the time started using these medical metaphors too, um, talking about slum surgery in St. Louis. And so blight maps also resembled the representation of cancer at the time. Uh, in this film from 1953 called The Warning Shadow, which used x-ray animations to depict the terrifying growth of a small back, black dysplasia on a man's lung, um, the film ends with the patient agreeing to a, a pneumonectomy, which is a surgical removal of the entire lung. And so eradication by surgery or radium was the preferred treatment for the disease. 
And so architects and planners would also seize on this treatment as a model for how blight should be treated in cities. Many municipal departments aided by private companies like the Rand Corporation first attempted immunizations, such as increased uh, municipal services, including fire and police stations, in attempts to enforce stricter building codes. But when this failed, they tried to turn to an urban chemotherapy, which was the total eradication of these clusters of blight. In his book, The City, Its Growth, Its Decay, and Its Future, E.L.L. Sarnan used a diagram of the disintegration of cells to discuss the disintegration of the fabric of the city and a healthy cell as a model of rebuilding, almost using this as sort of a literal plan for what the new city um, looks like. And so as they had in the sanitary movement, children were often invoked as innocent victims in order to further the cause. Uh, James W. Fullen, uh, who was the commissioner of the Urban Renewal Administration in a talk entitled Slums and Blight, A Disease of Urban Life, showed Gussie, which is a cartoon depiction of a waif-like young white girl as proxy for the deadly effect of slums on human lives. She's introduced standing on a pile of rubble or adrift on a sea of blight. And the book shows a series of map overlaying juvenile delinquency, lack of sanitation, tuberculosis, and population density and saying that the occurrences always point to the center of cities. And later Gussie is shown wielding the gargantuan broom of code enforcement, which you can see on the left there, uh, of, of health and sanitation. And so to address the issue, urban renewal documents from New York City to San Francisco depicted strikingly similar landscapes. Sleek, sterile towers on a flat platform of green. San Francisco's Jackson Square plan is showed as isolated from any fabric, save for City Hall, with no mention of the Fillmore neighborhood as a cultural center for the West Coast's small Black population at the time. 80% of those that were removed by urban renewal were Black, and in Baltimore, the number was reported to be 100%. The logic of blight as a disease was eradication, erasure, and reoccupation with a quote-unquote healthy graft of green. Which I think brings us to the era just before the pandemic, and we can talk about how these have converged now. But as I mentioned, you know, when I first started studying this topic, a lot of the discourse about uh, health and landscape architecture was really about changing behavior. Um, and a lot of this came from a fear of the disease that, you know, a lot of people would say, uh, you know, gra this nation grappled with um, just pre pandemic. Uh, and that is obesity. So the CDC reported that in the US, the percentage of overweight adults hovered around 31% between 1960 and 1994. And the percentage of adults categorized as obese increased from 13% to 23%. So meaning in the 90s, almost 55% of adults in the US in the mid 1990s were overweight or obese. In 2005, it was estimated to incur over 190 billion or almost 21% of all US healthcare expenditures. And researchers started to draw connections between larger patterns of change in society, ranging from food availability to technological attachment. But a great deal of literature started to point to sedentary lifestyles um, encouraged by the unabated suburban growth oriented around the automobile as a driver of the epidemic. And by the end of the 20th century, the locus of disease would shift from the city to the suburbs. So these figures notwithstanding, we do have to remember that the definition of obesity is still problematic in many respects, uh, from the unreliability of the body mass index or BMI um, and its actual relationship to overall health, but also cultural and racial ideas, uh, uh, ideals of bodies. Nevertheless, many designers and urban planners saw an opportunity to elevate their practice in the name of public health, um, but often instead exacerbated health inequities. Although on a related point, many have pointed out that the car-centric design exacerbates uh, climate change in urban heat islands, which also represent a larger ex existential threat to all of our health. And so a way people saw to, or architects and planners saw to combat this car-centric environment was perhaps in the lessons of new urbanism, which was based on highly specific urban and architectural codes to build neo-traditional neighborhoods. Some of the generalized uh, observations of the new urbanists were true. Yes, our environments have become very car centric, um, but it was also problematic in their steadfast belief that the old way of building was best. Um, and instead, a lot of the new urbanists sort of emphasized the historical blind spots of building for social change and then uncritically doubled down. 
Duane Plater Zyberg, uh, who are the designers of Seaside, uh, and you can see their urban code here. And really what this is, is an urban prescription, right? It's an urban prescription for everything that appears to ALIS in the suburb. So it's not just to address obesity and increase physical activity, um, but the new urbanists also claimed that their designs would improve social cohesion, civic participation, um, but above all, eliminate cars from the public realm. And the early new urbanists were particularly taken with regional interpretations of European architecture in the Deep South. And Duane and Plater Zyberg have cited that their inspirations came from a road trip to towns such as Savannah, Charleston, and Natchez, Mississippi, but don't reference the racial, social, or class systems inherent in those different forms of dwelling. Most of all, building to the prescriptive guidelines was difficult to enact within our existing tangle of sprawl and was instead relegated to being built on green fields and far from job centers. And so an example like Seaside, uh, it mostly operates as a, a community of second homes uh, for, for wealthy people. But there was another iteration of it and we can see that in the willingness of governments to invest in supposedly curative effects of new urbanism. And this became apparent when in the mid 1990s, new urbanism was adopted as a standard architectural and planning style of public housing under the Clinton administration's HOPE 6 development plans. HOPE 6 did attempt to take some lessons learned from the disastrous mid-century modernist public housing developments um, and instead proposed a scattered site strategy that would strategically infill often slightly higher income neighborhoods with smaller scale, single or multifamily housing. But just as in the mid century, the tactic of adopting a specific aesthetic for public housing, even if neo-traditionalism instead of modernism, still served to visually stigmatize those within while continuing to imply that those living in it would be uplifted and have their morals corrected through architecture. And so while again, it was largely a failure more in administration than design, the well-documented effects of displacement that were wrought by the HOPE 6 program as old high density units were torn down to build new ones, but the less numerous mid-scale ones were probably one of the largest detriments to residents' health. Nevertheless, the built environment was and is still viewed as a treatment for the obesity epidemic, extending from the figurative prescription of new urbanism. And, and now it's literally being described by the US Surgeon General, at least, you know, this, this is uh, Obama's uh, Surgeon General, who I believe is the Surgeon General again now, Vivek Murphy. Um, and this was his Step It Up campaign in 2015. Um, when, and I, th I think it's quite a move for a Surgeon General, right, to be interested in architecture and planning and landscape. So it's, it's promising for us that are interested in it. However, you know, if we think about this, to provide an environment that supports this behavior is definitely positive, but it's going to take a lot more to untangle our car-centric environments than just, you know, sort of rethinking our, our main streets or certain or new neighborhoods. And we have to deal with the fact that as cities and walkable neighborhoods have become more in demand, these ostensibly healthier and greener neighborhoods have also become less affordable because we don't have enough of them to meet demand. We should also interrogate the idea that at the same time, design planning and even the public health community um, has denigrated the suburb. And again, this is pre-pandemic. Our, our uh, concerns may have shifted or they will shift. We, won't, we don't know for quite some time. But at the same time in the discourse that the suburb kind of becomes the locus of bad health, it, it converges with facts from the Brookings Institution that suburbs are also becoming more racially and economically heterogeneous, which is a far cry from those kind of suburbs that were, that were described by the new urbanists long ago. Most of all, I think we need to rethink the idea that in the United States that where we live is a free choice or that it always reflects one's moral fortitude or your choices about your health. But this is also appropriate for a country that unfortunately has always conflated wellness with personal responsibility and not as a responsibility of the state. So just some nascent thoughts on COVID-19. And as I said, I, I turned in my manuscript just before the pandemic hit and luckily I brought it back and rewrote the conclusion, rewrote the introduction a little bit. Um, but what I think is most interesting is when, when we talk about the influence of the environment on COVID-19, we're actually seeing all three of these fears, uh, you know, converge. So we know COVID-19 is airborne, right? It gives credence to miasma theory. Um, does everybody remember the days, you know, one year ago? Feels like a century ago. <laughs> we're seeing a whole century converge in the past, uh, a century of health concerns converge in the last year. 
Um, but, you know, remember in the beginning, we were all sanitizing our groceries, right, and, and quarantining our mail, sort of the fear of germs there. Um, and we can definitely say that COVID-19 has shaped our behavior. We know how to social distance. We are quarantining. Um, and so I would say, like, that's maybe that's one revelation I have. I, I don't have much more, but I'm trying to work through them um, right now. Uh, what I will say is, I don't think this is the future of design, whether it's in product design or architecture or even landscape design. But the history I offer you here today, I hope we can take as a cautionary tale because there's one thing we have to remember, um, especially when it comes to our perceived uh, relationship between landscape and health specifically. And I can say that since I'm at a landscape architecture school. Um, so there's another consistency about everything I've talked about here is that every epidemic and the most misguided of its built environment cures always affects immigrants and communities of color first. This is a country that's founded on the removal of its indigenous people who were first decimated by the epidemics that were brought by colonizers. And they were systematically and forcibly moved off the land they had stewarded for decades while settlers celebrated the unspoiled quality of the landscape that had actually been stewarded there for, dec for, uh, for hundreds of years. In this painting by Thomas Cole, which is meant to celebrate the American landscape that we associate with health, with fresh air and water, devoid of man's pollution, actually sublimates the solitary figure of one Native American man hidden in the bottom foreground of the picture. And the absence of his tribe is speaking as much as his hidden presence. Going back to the cholera epidemic in this cartoon from Puck Magazine, cholera is conflated with newcomers, specifically immigrants. And the title of this piece was called The Kind of Assisted Immigrant We Cannot Afford to Admit. And here we see cholera depicted as a skeleton um, in vaguely Middle Eastern clothing. Over time, instead of taking consideration of the poor as a population vulnerable to disease, instead we blame them uh, for spreading contagion. And we have systematically removed and quarantined them, whether it's physically or economically, or subjected them to architectural experiments built on narratives and metaphor, rather than epidemiology or backed by social safety nets. And this becomes no more explicit when we think about the racist housing covenants uh, that many cities employed uh, in the mid-century. Um, a 1922 uh, covenant for Silver Spring, Maryland read, for the purposes of sanitation and health specifically, no owner will sell or lease the said land to anyone of a race whose death rate is at a higher percentage than the white race. Um, germ theory in the language of quarantine was used in Baltimore's residential segregation or ordinance of 1910. Um, and in San Francisco in Chinatown, Disease was used as a justification for the Department of Public Health to repeatedly raid and control the neighborhood's boundaries. Um, and medical inspections and fabricated assessments um, about Chinese populations were used to keep Chinese out of the city altogether. So we need to consider how health has been used to exclude groups from desirable landscapes and instead conscribe them to landscapes of risk. A recent study from a group of University of California researchers argued that we must reckon with how our social practice has long lasting physiological effects. By overlaying mortgage companies redlining maps with health data, they not only found that these neighborhoods were still largely occupied um, by black communities and immigrants, but that there remained a plethora of environmental hazards from air pollution to high lead content in the soil, uh, which resulted among other disparities in health, a three times higher asthma rate in black than whites. And we can't forget that even the most celebrated healthy landscape built by a revered landscape architect who was also an abolitionist uh, and a public health officer, but Central Park was built on the ruins of Seneca Village, which was a thriving African-American uh, community, which was nonetheless written up as a squatter's camp and depicted this way in Harper's Weekly as an uh, excuse to, uh, to raise it for the construction of the park. And so I would say, you know, instead of thinking about decontamination rooms or plexiglass desks in the future, instead we need to be asking ourselves about the conditions that cause urban heat islands and air pollution disproportionately in black and brown neighborhoods that have now proven to be underlying causes for COVID mortality. Instead of worrying about the conception of a very specific type of walkable and bikeable density that has dominated urban design discourse for the past couple decades, we also need to think about crowded housing for frontline workers or the forgotten densities, which were really eloquently written about by Canadian urbanist Jay Pitter in Azure Magazine a few months ago, thinking about if they have equitable access to green space and public transportation or slow streets as well. 
And we should ask ourselves what it is about suburban neighborhoods um, that is seeing spread you know, at the same rates as urban areas as well. Um, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, when it was here on the East Coast, I was asked by a few outlets if the high rates in New York and Boston signaled the end of cities. Um, but now that it's abated in these cities, or you know, we, we have more of the healthcare infrastructure to handle it, the pandemic has spiked in other places, whether it's the suburbs in Phoenix and California, um, the rural areas of South Dakota, which is where I, I grew up. I grew up in Western South Dakota. Um, and most crucially, the black and brown neighborhoods of the very same cities we were worried about before, but all of a sudden this, you know, this, this concern about density um, and cities uh, wasn't there anymore, but we were not looking at the built environments there to see if there are other uh, qualities that incubated it. But we still should ask ourselves is what is it about all these environments that might particularly accelerate the rate of infection? But I would leave you with this. The environment does not cause or cure disease, but it is a key factor in either providing opportunities for health, but also creating the risk of debilitating illness. The landscapes we inhabit embed themselves in our bones and organs over time, some pathways known and some not. In her essay, Shifting Sites, landscape architect Christina Hill discussed how in culture and in ecological science, we have long viewed our skins as boundaries between us and the natural world, but our skin is actually permeable. It's permeable to energy, it's permeable to materials and organisms, and now we know it's also permeable to the burdens of an inequitable social system. And we can accumulate illness, but we can also build resiliency over generation, and that's the choice that we have now. So as we endure this crisis and understand that there will probably be others ahead of us, let us take what we've learned from history and I hope we can leave a healthier future for all. Thank you. That was wonderful, Sarah. What a, what a great, great, great uh, sort of lecture and a way of bringing this topic uh, to the forefront of our minds. Terrific. Uh, Nathan, if you don't mind, can you uh, maybe help us sort out some questions that are now opening? You know, we want to hear from our students. We want to hear from, from everybody, our guests. We have some lovely guests here today. Uh, we're such a treat to have Sarah. Let's please pick a brain. <laughs> yes, so uh, everybody feel free to raise your hands or type in the question into your chat into the chat and uh, I'll just unmute people as questions come in. And I think some of the professors are co-hosts already so they can just ask directly. And I don't see any uh, questions right now from the students. <laughs> Hi Mark. Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry to ask a question. Um, Sarah, that was a great talk. I, I really enjoyed and appreciated your framing of it. And it's just such a critically important topic. The one, the one question that I have for you is that in, in talking about the historical development of the understanding of the relationship between design and health and, and the built environment, um, you identify a lot of the usual suspects in terms of Frederick Law Olmsted and Le Cabousier and urban renewal and so on. And I wonder if in your research, you uh, looked at some of the, the counter traditions that had existed during that time, like the settlement house movement in Chicago, people like Jane Addams and Florence Kelly, or um, there, were, there were a lot of groups that were advocating for a, a much more kind of socially oriented mm -hmm. approach to disease in the built environment. Yeah, absolutely. I, I did for the book, I wrote about the playground movement a lot and thinking about, you know, how these ideas about, um, you know, nature, like returning to nature and nature means various things, whether it's actually being in unurbanized areas, but also the nature of children, right, and um, definitely around settlement houses and um, playgrounds that were built with the cooperation of, of immigrant communities, right, were, um, which is a, another thing we should return to today. And this is, um, yeah, and I mean, for the cause of the, the structure of this lecture, I tried to keep it neat, but <laughs> luckily the book gives me room to be a little bit more sprawling. So, I mean, yeah, playgrounds are right about. It. And then, um, you know, I didn't talk about it in the lecture today, but I also think there's so much promising research being done today in terms of small landscapes, right? And, and thinking about equitable landscapes. And 
learning more about the relationship between um, mental health and landscapes. And I, I wrote about actually, you know, here in Massachusetts, some of the work done by Groundwork, which is a tree planting campaign, which we hear a lot, you know, so just plant trees, plant trees, it'll be fine. But the planting trees is actually like a much more um, difficult process. It had to be done with community buy-in with an understanding about what the specific health concerns um, were there. So I, I would say that's sort of a, a counter movement to um, some of the larger voices today. Really fascinating um, work um, done by the physician, another physician, um, Jeannie South in Pennsylvania, who was looking at greening, I think five, 400, 500 vacant lots uh, across Philadelphia. And I, I think this is the key is how do we get past this conception of health or the aesthetic of health, but think about how we can change landscapes in meaningful and equitable ways, um, but maybe maybe smaller ways, right, to make real improvements in, in neighborhoods. And I think the key to all of this is, is just understanding what are the health concerns of, of communities that we're, that we're going in. Oh, uh, expand on the term nature of children, right? So, um, so it's interesting that uh, in the playground movement um, I think it, because you have to keep in mind that this is coming um, on the tail of child labor laws, right? Where, where children had been forced into factories for a long time. And so there were a lot of um, a, a lot of activists that were saying, you need to let children play, right? You need, to <laughs> you, need, you need to just let them play. You need to discover their capacity for play. So not give them too much um, on, on the playground. Um, and, you know, we can also talk about this in the rise of, of places like adventure playgrounds, right? Which don't have the restrictions around it, but let them sort of uh, form civic society. <laughs> <laughs> in itself. So after the child labor movement, there was a, a lot written about how we need to let children be children. Um, and at the same time, there was a lot of discourse about return to nature, all these people that had come to cities. Um, so kind of like reclaiming our, 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 our nature within. So not just of, um, of children, but of, of people living in cities, uh, discovering our, our agricultural or, or um, our heritage in nature. So I just think it's interesting that it, it, those, those two movements occurred at the same time. I have a question. I think that um, you, know, you, you made us realize so well that in the, in the name of health, sometimes we as designers may be uh, damaging you know, vulnerable communities or increasing their likelihood of um, being able to stay in certain places, et cetera. So, um, as, a, as an educator, which you're a wonderful educator, I've been to your class, uh, what are some of the tools that we can begin to apply or ways of thinking to not fall into promoting, um, you know, falling into the potential trap that just advocating for these things seem to be out there to be doing good for everyone and, and be more critical. What does that look like? Yeah, I think um, I mean, we can, um, oh, sorry, I just lost my Zoom screen. Um, we can, uh, yeah, I think, uh, so there's really interesting conversations right now about the, the idea of just green enough, which I, I take some issue with, right? Because doesn't everybody deserve the best green space? Doesn't everybody deserve, um, you know, access to green spaces? But I think a lot of it has to do with, okay, what was there before? Being cognizant of these injustices um, that have been um, you know, wrought on communities in the past to make sure you are doing something that's not um, too radical, right? Because that can be upsetting for health too, especially uh, mental health, to not too radically change people's um, built environments, but to do it incrementally, right? And with, with um, in, in concert with the communities that live there. And I think that's why the, the groundwork uh, project is really exciting, uh, is a good precedent to look at because you know, the people that were working on that, they just went to parks, they went to public parks and they just had a board up with a sticker and they just said, what are you most concerned about with your health, right? And you know, we might think one thing from, um, from looking at data, right? From looking at health data, but something they didn't think about, they didn't have on the list was addiction actually. And they had sticky points and let people talk about like they were, they were worried about neighbors that had fall, or family members that had fallen to um, that had fallen to addiction, right? And they were worried about clean air and clean water. And that's what I would say. The next words is we, you know, we can think about things that look healthy, or we just say, you know, green is good. But we also have to remember that um, not just the basic provisions of clean air and clean water, clean soil, right? 
can go a long way also, like in a very acute way. It's not just sort of about this conception of health, but there are very direct ways that we can address environmental justice instead. And so, I don't know, that's, that's, what, that's what I would take, yeah. I see some questions. Um, Yes, there's one from Jeanette Pantoja. Um, I can unmute Jeanette if she or he or she wants. Hi, I was very interested in all the examples you had about, you know, pathologizing the urban environment. And I'm thinking about like the flip side of that, all this um, enthusiasm there is among health systems right now to um, engage and invest in housing and engage and invest in community development. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you have any kind of concerns about that. You know, I've, I've heard from some folks that they could over medicalize these, you know, community <laughs> development systems or just mm -hmm. like bring a lot of power to some of these tables and um, affect them in that way. Yeah, I, uh, that's right. It's, it's something I just touched on, but I think there's actually a lot of promise in it. I mean, because let's be frank, like the budgets for public health and for architecture and landscape architecture are all always underfunded, <laughs> right? And if you can get sort of the, the money of hospitals and if they're really interested in this concept, which again, is actually, I, I think it's promising in this way because actually the interest of healthcare systems in moving outside healthcare about moving outside the hospital and knowing that a lot of the health problems we deal with now is preventative, that's actually a big shift in of itself, right? And that's maybe some momentum that um, that we should embrace. Also, I mean, what's been really helpful is with Obamacare, the impetus for, um, for hospitals to do the community health needs assessments, right? Which can do it in a much more detailed way, a much more qualitative way than maybe we could as designers and just go into a, a neighborhood and, you know, looking at it that way. Um, and so I, I think it's, I, I think it's promising. I, we should think about collaborations, right, with them to make sure, as I think it's a good point that we're over medicalizing it. And I think something else I found in my research is not to, you don't want to concentrate on just one health outcome, right? Um, there's been a, a problem with that through history that whereas we're just concentrating on, um, you know, miasma, or we're just concentrating on getting rid of cars, right? And not thinking about health holistically. Um, and so I would hope, and actually, I mean, this is something I've been thinking about as somebody that worked in, on, in healthcare and on hospitals and now is interested in the landscape, what is the potential for those collaborations, right, between designers um, and hospitals that are interested in health and thinking more holistically um, about what a community a neighborhood is? Because, you know, what I found from working in Sacramento on the, with this community-based organization that I, I work with, Design for Active Sacramento, is that everybody has different, they're all interested in health in the built environment, but everybody has different conceptions on, on how to do that. And as I mentioned, you know, I work on with that organization and we have a neurosurgeon who thinks very differently, <laughs> was at least she's coming around to the idea about environment and health, transportation engineers, um, planners. So if we can be involved in those conversations and some of it, there's a language barrier admittedly and some of that and, and thinking about like how we understand places. Um, I think, I think it's actually promising. So um, ca cautiously promising. So, because at least somebody's interested in it. Somebody with money is, is, is interested, is interested in it. <laughs> so. Sarah, I, I have a um, question about terrific talk. And it seems like this um, theme of um, healthy things always coming back. I just put something in the chat here. Martin Wagner, German oh, thank architect, you. probably uh, know him. I mean, he wrote about this like 100 years ago, and, and he looked in his dissertation actually on American cities and uh, uh, said how, how, well, that they have more advanced concepts. I think he read about Central Park, probably um, Chicago too. So um, uh, I have a like availability of, of, of green, green space seems to be more like even during a, not specific during the pandemic, even um, like an issue or a thing that has been uh, recognized more and more. Um, and uh, what is your take on that? Like, um, like uh, how available it is to diverse groups or think about it in a democracy 
um, equally. And um, like my, my, my favorite example is New York City, Bryant Park, nice clearly done. Five years later, it's just a nice commercial space in booth and with uh, like for se uh, selling things becoming a very commercial landscape. So public mm -hmm. landscapes becoming commercial right. landscapes. Yeah. Uh, so how it's, like what what what's your what what's what's your take on that like uh, availability of of um, of green because it, in theory it could be evenly distributed. Cities claim right. they have the most uh, green most trees in the United States, but actually it's only where some people live in. So yeah. Uh, so I mean I think this is it, it kind of relates back to sort of my first revelation is like what if we thought of landscape infrastructure as health infrastructure. Right, which is maybe, although you know, in this country, health infrastructure is privatized too. So, <laughs> it really, so maybe it's not surprising that a lot of our landscapes end up, you know, being privately surveilled or, or run by private corporations. And so, I, I, I guess it's not. Um, I, I don't want to take the easy way out on this, but I, I do think like we need to rethink those systems together that they are there for the public good right and that's why, why I said it's. Um, even the hospitals are still you know maybe maybe we're at a point where I, I hope I hope we're starting to rethink healthcare access and, and health access right and the different ways and the holistic ways of, of thinking about health. Um, starting to link environmental and, and I think. It's funny because I talk about this all the time. I feel like I'm always preaching to the choir, but we have to remember that a lot of people don't make these connections, right? Between landscape and health and they wanna see numbers and they wanna see like money saved. And um, as that uh, as that evidence comes to light, maybe we can use that to, um, to thinking about it. But I think it's just, it's sort of a way of how we think about our public infrastructure in the United States, which is, is sadly really, really underfunded. But I think the two come together, which is, you know, Jeanette's great question. I, I, I think at least with hospitals starting to enter this arena and starting to tell people that health is not just about going to the hospital when you're sick, right? But it's ensuring the the WHO, the, the World Health Organization definition of health, right? Which is well-being for all. Um, but, you know, that's something Europe is a lot better about, but we're, we're not in the United States uh, about thinking about these long-term effects. Well, and then you have like groups saying, well, if we build this beautiful park here in an underserved community, um, then the rent's going up and we're going right. to leave. So, so you're getting like, uh, okay, so we do nothing now. So it's, it's yeah, kind of no, so it is an issue. And I think this is when we're talking about health, it's about the collaboration and it's not just about the design itself, but it's about the programs that you're building in, right? So if we know that green space, and you know, and Olmsted wrote a lot of his book saying like, well, this will help real estate. There was a way he kind of sold the parks was it will make your land values raise. And so that's that effect has been known for a long time. How do we see that as a disadvantage rather than an advantage that we're not just putting in green to, to rise up raise? And how do we protect the people that, that live there before? And so I think this is, it's not just about it's not just about the design, right? It's not just about an ostensibly healthy design, but it's about the programs and most of all protections um, you build around it because we know that um, you know these healthy neighborhoods are going to um, are, are going to be in demand, right? And and raise prices. So. Yeah, I mean, you cannot like you have to do other t tools too to, yes. to make it happen. And, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Right, it's not like isolated. And uh, I mean, society has to like begin a change of, of thinking too. I right. guess. Yeah, and I mean, you know, it may be purposeful in, in some cases, right, to raise the land values around it by using parks, but we should um, we should know that that's a fact and, and hopefully fight fight that a little bit. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. We have a question from Zach Bergeron. Mm -hmm. um, oh, he just left. Yeah. Um, can I? Can I? He can, you can send him my email. Actually, I don't know if you want to, if anybody wants to share my email. I'm happy. I know we're getting to the end of our time here, but if right. anybody has any questions, I'm happy to, um, to answer them over email. Um, I just want to quickly shout out my former student, Emily, who I see with her camera on, who left Northeastern for UMass Amherst because they actually have a landscape architecture program. <laughs> but she took my class on designing for health, so she may have heard all this before. <laughs> I can't remember. 
All right. Well, I think this is probably a good stopping point. Sarah, thank you for a wonderful talk. So inspiring uh, and generative of, of, of good things for us to pay attention to and incorporate in our in our research and our work as designers. We're truly honored to have you and uh, want to welcome you anytime. I can't wait for to our building. <laughs> You're always welcome. It is it is less than two hours away. It's not that far. <laughs> We'd love to have you in person um, once COVID is a little bit under control. Um, yeah. And really, wanted wanted to thank you uh, for for sharing your work with us and and for your work. It's truly yeah. truly thank impressive. You. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Great. <laughs> look forward look forward to uh, to meeting you all in person one of these days. For sure. Okay. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.